Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Aminirod and I am the PBRN coordinator with DOTouch.net. Thank you for joining us for this month's episode of Let's Talk About OMM Research. Before, before we begin, let's take a moment for the housekeeping rules of the webinar. If you have technical issues during the webinar, please send a message to me, Jane Johnson, or G. Franklin. If you have questions or comments during the presentation, please feel free to, chat, to type them into the chat and to address each other's questions and comments there as well. After the presentation, we will have time for discussion and questions. If you would like to speak during the discussion, please raise your hand and we will unmute your microphone. We ask that you briefly introduce yourself and please feel free to turn on your camera. When contributing to the discussion, please limit microphone time to three minutes to allow for everyone who wants to participate in the discussion. Please keep in mind that this webinar is being recorded and will be placed on the public DOTouch.net YouTube channel. While this webinar is not for CME credit, we would still appreciate your feedback in the program survey that will be emailed to you this afternoon. Today is our Let's Talk About OMM Research Journal Club with Dr. Regina Fleming. Today she will discuss the journal article, Efficacy of Osteopathic Manipulative Treatment in Patients with Parkinson's Disease, a Narrative Review. Dr. Fleming is an Associate Professor and the Chair of the Department of OMM at New York Institute of Technology College of Osteopathic Medicine in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Dr. Fleming received her doctor, her doctor of Osteopathic Medicine from A.T. Still University in Kirksville, Missouri in 2011. Since that time, she has been in practice, heavily involved in osteopathic research, published many research papers, given several educational presentations, and won numerous, won numerous awards and held multiple titles. I would name all of them, but she has to have time to present as well. And this year, she was named the Arkansas Osteopathic Physician of the Year. It is my honor to introduce to you Dr. Regina Fleming. Thank you. That was quite an introduction. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As uh, Sarah already said, I've chosen this article here, The Efficacy of Osteopathic Manipulative Treatment in Patients with Parkinson's Disease, a narrative review for us to discuss today, to review and discuss. So the objective of this was really they were looking at the literature that had been published in the past 10 years, looking for evidence of o OMT helping with the motor dysfunction that happens with uh, Parkinson's disease and also the autonomic dysfunction that happens as well. So the databases that they use were these databases that I have listed here for you. Dr. Fleming, you're yeah. not sharing your presentation. Oh, darn. <laughs> I'll just start over again. <laughs> Thank you so much for letting me know that. I hate to interrupt. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you for please for it. please do. Can you see my title page now? Yes, ma'am. You're good now. Excellent. Thank you so much. I mm -hmm. deeply apologize, everyone. So once again, this here is the article that I chose for us to review and discuss in today's uh, journal club session with dotouch.net. Once again, the objective. I've already talked about, but what they were looking for is looking for anything in the literature that had been published in the last 10 years, looking for evidence that OMT can help with the motor dysfunction and the autonomic dysfunction when it comes to patients with Parkinson's disease. These here are the databases that they uh, searched, and they did two search dates at different time points. One was August of 2019, and again in February of 2021. And then keywords, as you know, when you're doing any sort of lit search, keywords are very important to uh, consider and to use. And so these were the keywords that they utilized, OMM, OMT, osteopathic, Parkinson's disease, manual therapy, physical therapy, training, autonomics, gait, and balance. Their inclusion criteria was that the article had to be published between 2010 and 2021. The subjects had to be patients that had Parkinson's disease, as well as the techniques then used had to include OMT or some other form of manual therapy. And for the manual therapies to be included for this inclusion criteria, it had to be very similar to an existing OMT technique already. Now, their exclusion criteria when they did their search was case studies, any conference abstracts, and then obviously any article that they were not able to decipher, and this case was not written in English. They ended up with over 10,000 hits, as you can see here, 53 articles that they then reviewed and that were considered, but only five articles in the last 10 years actually met their criteria. 
So I'm just going to quickly, we're not going to go in depth on all these five articles, but we are going to quickly take a look at them and just sort of review them. So this here is the first article, Osteopathic Manipulation as a Complementary Approach to Parkinson's Disease. This is a pilot study that was done in New York. This is their protocol. And I love that they have their protocol here. This is always really important when you're considering a research <laughs> a study to include your protocol so other people look at it. So what they did was this study took place basically over 12 weeks and they had two arms here. Their control group would have started off with six weeks of counseling. So they showed up for one hour each week and they would have gone like the first one would have been like detailed history of Parkinson's disease. I'm going to point out here that they included counseling on falls, including the causes and precautions, because so the first part was really education for the patients. So they did six weeks where they met for one hour in a 60 minute session and they did a counseling. Then what they did was after completing this control here, they did six weeks of OML. So this was going to be two 30-minute sessions where they had OML. And here's the protocol that they did that you guys can review that they did that they believe would help their patients that suffer from Parkinson's disease. I will also point out that a lot of it also has to do with like circumduction of the wrist. So it has to do with joint mobility as well. Now, so that was basically sort of their control group, and then the OML, and then they have the other arm that started with OML for the first six weeks, and then did the counseling for the next six weeks. The sample size, as you can see here, is rather low, and I'm going to point out the sample size for each study as we go through. Their final sample size was only nine uh, subjects here. So they had basically three tests that they were using to evaluate, and these tests were done on day one and then week six of all subjects. So the sensory organization test did not show any statistically uh, significant improvement. Their mini uh, balance evaluation systems test did not show anything significantly as well. Once again, sample size was nine here. However, they did notice some clinically relevant uh, changes here. Keep in mind that a score for this mini balance evaluation systems test, a score of less than 19 means that you have a greater risk of falling. So notice that all the uh, different groups, the OML and also the counseling started off here in the 17 range. And after OML or even after counseling, now they're up here in the 19 range. So the thought here is that this is clinically relevant. And maybe if we had a larger sample size, we would have actually seen something be statistically significant. But the other thing I think to take from this is that educating the subjects about like the risk of falling clearly played a very important role, I think, with these patients on a clinical basis. So let's, we're going to keep that thought in mind on how I think education can play an important role here for our patients that have Parkinson's disease. Now, when they did their Movement Disorder Society Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, now for this study, they only did part three, but it did show statistically significant changes after OML and both the control and the experimental group here. And they were, had basically the motor function with the study, they had an improvement of 4.3%. Once again, did not show a statistical significant change in balance, but we do see some clinically relevant changes, we believe. And um, that's it really for that study. Does anyone have any questions on this study? Okay, like I said, N of nine, it would be great if this one could be redone and on a larger scale. So our second study here, I have had to actually look up what on my massage was. So this study is the effectiveness of on my massage therapy and alleviating physical symptoms and outpatients with Parkinson's disease, a before after study. So on my massage is actually traditional is a traditional Japanese massage I was reading about. And it's a massage that utilizes techniques such as kneading, stroking, and pressing, and rhythmic motions to target muscles and joints, traditionally along meridians. Uh, it has been shown to help with lymphatics and muscle tightness and so forth. Looking at other studies, I just really got interested in this. They also had a great protocol in their study too, which I have up here. This is like the first page of the protocol. It's a very long protocol. I'm just going to quickly go over some of the stuff that they did, but you can see how they did like thumb kneading by circular or linear uh, movement for like the upper trap, downward stroking along the length of the back, all the way from the base of the neck to the iliac crest. Then when we get to the upper limb and ham, they did once again, sort of kneading and stroking again. The neck, same thing, 
as you go through this and you read everything that they had done, honestly, I want to sign up for this. <laughs> and here's the next page that they did also as well for the lower extremities and so forth. So this entire session here was actually a full body on my massage and it was done in 40 minutes is what they did. The other thing I really liked that they did with this is during these exercises, the therapist and the patient would orally count together in a manner synchronized with the exercise movements in order to increase awareness of the rhythm. I think so that's really also having now the patients really focus in and think about the treatment that they're getting. And I really like that aspect as well. So the reported findings were very similar. So this had an N of 21. And then six of those patients, of those 21 patients, went on and had this performed weekly for seven weeks, whereas the rest only had it done one time. They didn't see any difference between the, the patients having it done just one time versus those who had it weekly for seven weeks. But what they did see is with this protocol that they had for on the massage, they saw a decrease in muscle stiffness. They saw improvement in uh, their movement abilities. They saw a decrease in fatigue. Um, the upper limb function improved on time pegboard tests. That was actually for their dominant arm. And for all the patients in this study, it was actually their right hand. They didn't see a change in the non-dominant hand, but they did see improvement with the dominant hand there. The gait speed was shorter. There wasn't really any change with the cadence at all with gait. And then of course the uh, range of motion increase for the shoulder there as well. Our third study is the effects of coordination and manipulation therapy for patients with Parkinson's disease. Now this study was done in China and it's also was done at an in inpatient rehabilitation center. So with this one, we have an end of 36. Also with this one, they incorporated exercise. They actually did about 30 minutes of what they call dry land swimming, and they had them mimic the breaststroke is what they had them do for about 30 minutes. They then only did about three minutes of what would equate to about soft tissue to the paraspinal muscles of the thoracic region. I have down here at the very bottom, you can see my arrow where this straw, uh, star is. This is pulled right from them of how they described it. They described it as the paraspinal muscles were massaged slightly with the thumbs or the inner eminence for three minutes. This was actually done, it looks like from reading the study, was actually done by nurses. So this was not done by a manual therapist. This was not done by someone board certified in OML or even one of our European cohorts. It was just done by nurses that were trained in this. And like I said, I'm question the slightly massaged part, but once again, and then they also did stretches for three minutes. And these stretches were a uh, thoracic extension focusing at C6 to T12, as well as thoracic flexion. And then what they called waist rotation. And so the stretching also went on for three minutes. So that's what they considered sort of their manipulation part was three minutes of a slight massage with thumbs within our eminence administered by a nurse. And then three minutes of basically stretching the thoracic spine, flexion, extension, and rotation. But they saw some great results. And I, but I do think most of the results are probably going to be attributed to the exercise that they did every day. By the way, this was every day for a year. And when I say every day, every work day, let me clarify. So it did not occur on weekends, apparently, because it specifically said every work day. So, and I pulled from the original study sort of what their results were here. And as you can see, the balance scale, you can see how much that improved from the very beginning to the end of the year. The other thing to note here is that the control group actually got worse with their balance and with the uh, tug test and everything like that, they actually became much worse over time. Whereas the CMT group or, you know, the exercise and manipulation group actually became much better over time, as well as their ejection fraction. And that's why I liked this chart so much is if we look here at their ejection fraction, we can see how that improved over time. And then we can also see how it did not really improve over time for the control group. So this was a great study. Um, it's hard to differentiate whether or not what role OMT had, though, versus the 30 minutes of exercise that uh, these participants had. So our next study is the comparison of gait training versus cranial osteopathy in patients with Parkinson's disease pilot study. So this study was done in Germany and it was done over two days. And so an N of 17. So what it was is if we look over here at this arm here, so this patient here, they would have had a cranial treatment done on day one 
And then they would have come back and they would have had gait training as the intervention on day two. Now, before they did any of the interventions, whether it was a cranial treatment or gait training, they had them walk, uh, do a 10 meter walk where they measured everything before and then after the intervention. Now, unfortunately, there was no protocol or anything. It was just a cranial treatment that they got. I, I can't comment any more on it than that. But we also, even with a small sample size, we did see some changes. And so the gait training was shown to reduce the number of steps. And then the cranial treatment was actually shown to reduce the interval, but not step quantity. And then we get to another really interesting study. So this was the gut microbiome changes with osteopathic treatment of constipation and Parkinson's disease, another pilot study. So once again, they had a great protocol written up that you can go through and look at so you could repeat these if you wanted to repeat the study on a larger scale or even do another pilot study if you wished. And so suboccipital release, respiratory diaphragm, and then uh, the ganglion inhibition, paraspinal inhibition, SI joint decompression, sacral rock, mesenteric release of the colon and colonic stimulation. So really focusing on the constipation aspect or the autonomic dysfunction that can happen with Parkinson's disease. So six patients, small sample size again. These patients, however, were followed for a total of 10 weeks, four weeks as a control, four weeks then with a weekly OML treatment, and then two weeks of no intervention. And they collected stool samples and I already went over the protocol that they did. They also, this was a really cool study because they also looked at the micro, um, at the floral changes happening within the gut as well when they were collecting the stool samples. So they saw obviously a decrease with constipation, which is great, and a decrease by roughly 40%. They also had an increase or an improvement in the quality of life by roughly 29% for their patients. And then once again, we saw the changes that happened with the flora. Now, one, they did collect some information on diet, but as we're aware, there's a lot of information out there on diet and then the floral changes that happen within the gut with our diet, like high protein diet versus all these other diets. So they didn't have quite enough information as I would have liked on the diet, but they did a pretty good job collecting information on that. So with these five studies, we have an end total of 89. If we take out the exercise group, the study that had the 30 minutes of dry land swimming, because I do think exercise played a very big role in a lot of the improvements that they saw there, you're down to an N of 53. I, I put that out there because these are some great studies that are showing some great results and a very small sample size. And we have roughly, I think I read roughly a million patients, 1.2 million patients in the U.S. alone who have Parkinson's disease. And we're seeing the incidence of Parkinson's go up every year. I think they're diagnosing roughly about 90,000 new patients every year in the United States with Parkinson's disease. So the concern is obviously that we're going to see an increase with Parkinson's over time. And I think this is definitely an avenue that we should be investigating more is looking at the effects of not just OMT, but from what these studies have shown, exercise on Parkinson's, as well as education for our patients that have Parkinson's disease. So I think there's really three things that we could really help our patients with, with Parkinson's disease. And yes, OMT, but also education and also exercise. And with that, I'd like to open it up to the group for any thoughts or questions and uh, discussion on what you guys thought. So you guys can um, feel free to put your questions or comments in the chat, and I'd be happy to answer or ask them to Dr. Fleming for you, or you can raise your hand and we will unmute your mic and you can turn on your camera. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I just want to say, Dr. Fleming, I was really excited for this. Um, on a personal level, I have a family member who actually passed away in 2004, um, so people don't die from Parkinson's, right? They die from the effects of, and so he actually fell and broke his neck. And um, um, I have often one, and at that time they didn't understand Parkinson's a lot. They didn't know really what to do. And our family had never heard of OMM, OMT, you know, and so I've often wondered after getting into this field, would that have helped? Could that have done anything, you know? So I was really excited for this presentation today. So thank you very much. Yes. 
I, I'm really sorry to hear about your loss. I will say there are other studies on Parkinson's done, but they didn't fall within the window for this mm -hmm. study that I chose. But there are other really good studies out there. And like I said, so just focusing on the small window that this study did, I think, like I said, I think this is a great um, disease that we should definitely continue our investigation on and right. further studies because I think we can help. Yes. Right. And I think a sample size of 53, while it's only 53, quote unquote, like you're saying, the diagnosis is going up every year. And I, I any kind of manual therapy, I feel like on a personal level would have been very welcomed, <laughs> you know, anything that could have helped. So, or even, you know, piloted, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we do have a question in the chat. Um, Dr. Dagenhart would like to know, can you be more specific regarding outcome measures in the second study, i.e. stiffness? Uh, that second study, the uh, measures were done uh, most often with a visual analog scale. So it was the patients reporting a, uh, what they were for the uh, animal massage therapy. Does that answer your question that they use the visual analog scale when deciding how they would rate that? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. I, I do have another question since, since uh, we do have the luxury of having um, uh, uh, some authors as part of, uh, of, of the journals that you reviewed. Thinking about the first study that you talked about, um, being that there in the end there was like an N of nine and there was a control group, uh, which, you know, when you have that small of a population that, that really, you know, kind of puts puts a major hamper in 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 it. So in in from my perspective, it really kind of defines a feasibility study. I mean, uh, is it how possible was it? And what are the issues that was were confronted and why we were only able to get nine people in the study or complete in the study? Are there any recommendations uh, that the uh, people who ran this study might have uh, for DO TouchNet that would, you know, help set a guide for future research in this from, from their experience. Dr. Yao, are you on? It was tough to get the subject to commit. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm on. Thank you, Regina. That was great. Uh, really appreciated your uh, summary of the articles that were included. Um, yeah. Brian, the, the challenges really were, we're, we were trying to recruit Parkinson's patients. For them to qualify, they had to have motor dysfunction already. So patients with motor dysfunction already, they require help getting to our health center. They need a ride. They need a significant other to help bring them. And so when we said, hey, this, this is going to be a twice a week process for half an hour to get treatment, um, it's a lot for them. Um, plus, we wanted them to come in an additional time to do these measurements off meds. So in order for Parkinson's patients to have an accurate assessment of their motor function, they can't be coming in on different levels of medication. So when we screened them, they were off their medications. And when they came back in for their um, reevaluations, they were off their meds. And that's even more challenging for um, their caregivers to 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 do so. So um, yes, there's a lot of people diagnosed with Parkinson's out there, but we wanted people who had motor dysfunction already. So that on the HY scale was a two or worse. Uh, so they had to qualify for the study. And then once doing so, um, we, we designed our protocol so that it would kind of mirror what happens with exercise. So they've done studies looking at Parkinson's and exercise. And really after six weeks of exercise is when they really start to see motor improvement. So we wanted to kind of mimic that. And that's why our protocol was designed to be six weeks long. We did do like a crossover study, like Regina was explaining, like they either did counseling first and then OMM or OMM first and then counseling. Um, so it really became like a 12 week study. So it was a very long time for subjects to commit and some did drop out. So um, like you said, Dr. Degenhardt, it was more of like a feasibility to start. And it was nice to kind of see um, the changes. And the other thing that Regina pointed out is that, yes, there was no statistical difference between the treatment arm and the counseling arm, um, but th they both had improvement. And one of the things that we've noticed with Parkinson's is that there are very uh, influential group, like you could really influence them 
placebo wise like almost, you could do anything to them and say it'll help them and it'll help them like it's just the the that group of patient population uh subjects that parkinson's patients are are influenceable with like this positive um outlook and so um yeah it, it, there are definitely challenges to doing a, a longer study and especially this patient uh, population, but uh, it was really wonderful to to work with these subjects and um, they all were so dedicated to come like 12 weeks in a row to, and do whatever um, exercises and all these different measurements that we were trying to do on them. I think my three minutes are up. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Dr. Yao. Um, Dr. Brooks has a question, and before we get to you, Dr. Brooks, I just have a quick question um, about those social determinants, Dr. Yao, for the patients who would need a ride or something like that. Did you guys offer anything, any kind of incentive like that to the patients in, in order to, to participate? We initially were not funded by the AOA, but once we got funding from by AOA grant, we did offer, um, I think it was like $50 gift cards for every six uh, weeks of visits or something like that. We we just try to offset a little bit of their cost by providing gift cards. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, Dr. Brooks, if you would like to ask your question. So my understanding, and I'm not a neurologist, is that vigorous exercise has become pretty much the standard of care for people with Parkinson's to whatever extent they're able. So I'm wondering if the question should be whether OMT would facilitate exercise, whether someone could engage in exercise XYZ and then have OMT and now they could do XYZ times two. Oh. So that's just an idea for, for people to think about. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes, a very good idea. Does anybody else have any questions or comments for Dr. Fleming or Dr. Yao, since Dr. Yao is one of the authors of this study? And Dr. Uh, Mancini is on as well. She was the one who did the gut flora study, which was very- Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yes. Uh, Dr. John says, a little off topic, but research design, is there a move away from an OMM arm and not sham arm versus CC group? Are current manual medicine studies moving IA different direction? I think that means in a different direction. <laughs> you know, I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Dagenhardt. I think he's going to be better able to answer that question than I am. Yeah. Um, I think that this is a, a always an area of of discussion um, and depending upon you know what region and people's experience are you are going to get different responses to this question I, I think we're only beginning to better understand how to evaluate placebo I think we're going to have a whole new level of research because of, uh, of our advances in understanding just the, the the potency of placebo itself and um, so you know, we've always tried to, to, to look at manipulative medicine in dis, as distinct from placebo versus saying it's just part of, you know, the therapeutic potential or, or the effect of, of OMT is, is uh, you know, whatever the placebo is, that that creates an additive or additional effect. We have seen many studies where what we thought was, should have been an inner you know, um, uh, light touch intervention group that it does show improvement, uh, not to the level that the OMT group did, but would not be statistically different than the OMT group. That was certainly a recurrent phenomenon. So I do think that, that you know, we've often been concerned about having rigorous controls, uh, having a placebo sham group, my impression from NIH is really their, their concern is that it may be better for us to look at more comparative effectiveness approaches, looking at more than one form of intervention, because all of them, um, I mean, you just, you cannot eliminate out, you know, um, you know, placebo, you cannot eliminate a therapeutic potential of touch itself, unless you're going to cause harm as part of the touch. 
Thank you, Dr. Dagenhart. Jane, did you have a question? Yes, <laughs> that, uh, just just to add uh, to, to that discussion, you know, having multiple different types of control groups. So, you know, you have uh, a, maybe you have a light touch sham group and then you also have a an what's called an attention placebo group. So the, per, the patient is not touched, but, but they get the same amount of, of contact with a, 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 an osteopathic physician, for example. Um, and, and then, you know, another, another possible control group is, uh, you know, what we'd call conventional care. Uh, and, and so having, you know, you're greatly expanding the number of participants you need to have like these graded uh, control group levels, but it, it would help enable us to, to figure out uh, um, as Sheldon was saying about you know, for instance, the placebo effect, you know, is that just the attention versus the touch, you know? So that's just my addition to the, to the discussion. Thank you, Jane. Does anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns? Dr. Dagenhart, yes, sir. I have another question for those who uh, have um, uh, greater experience in, in the methodology. I mean, um, in looking at issues of feasibility, we, we obviously have already identified the importance of this area for research. The issue in my mind is, well, what is it that we have to overcome in order to, to make that happen. And so how long were the, the patients, you know, you said they often had to drive half an hour to get to the clinic. How long were they, I, I mean, Parkinson's patients, there's a certain level of energy uh, and they start decompensating pretty rapidly. I mean, what, what from your experience, what, what do you think is feasible from us from an OMT perspective to actually be successful at a, a, a larger, more comprehensive research uh, design. And that question was directed towards Dr. Yao, correct? They're currently doing research on Parkinson's as well. So I'm gonna let Dr. Yao answer that question. So in terms of like a, duration of time in the office, I think one hour is really pushing it. Like our protocol ran a half an hour easy. And so I think having them in the office for an hour is definitely pushing it. Uh, they start to get hungry, hangry, <laughs> they, you know, antsy. Um, the other thing that was interesting before this study, I was doing a study looking at Parkinson because they have restrictive lung disease um, and whether or not OMM to their rib cage, mobilization of the thoracic cage would help their PFTs. And I did light touch versus actual OMM, pec lift, rib raising, articulatory, thoracic spine, domina diaphragm, and inlet. And in my Parkinson's patients, they actually did worse after the OMM. And I think part of theory, I think, is that their medications wore off. I didn't have them come in off meds. And they, you know, did PFTs. They got the OMM. They sat around. They got repeat PFTs. By that time, they fatigued. And so there's some definite things to consider when you're designing a study, especially with Parkinson's, and definitely how much time they're sitting around, how many different measures you're making them do. Like, timed up and go is a common one. They have to get up from a chair and walk, turn around, sit back down. If you repeat that, you know, two, three times, like we were repeating the PFTs like four or five times. If you ever took a deep, deep breath and blew out as hard as you could, that takes a lot of work. <laughs> and so 
um, I, I would just kind of make, as you're designing these studies, kind of be aware for any of these studies, um, what, what a person has to go through. Because I think as researchers, we try to throw as much as we can at them. It's like, oh, by the, since we're doing OMM twice a week, you know, for six weeks, let's try to gather as much information as we can. So we'll do the UPDRS, we'll do the tug test, we'll do all these different tests. But then if you try to do all those tests, it's going to be like two hours. And so we also try to like, you know, separate things out where we could try to uh, administer surveys um, over the phone first, instead of doing the survey intake um, at the same in-person visit, just ways to kind of decrease the um, time it takes that you need to have them in one spot um, at a time. So. Those are some of the considerations. I hope that helps. The study done in China that had the exercise, because imagine how hard it is to do a breaststroke on land for 30 minutes. They actually used, while they were doing that exercise, the Borg self-perceived fatigue scale. And if the patient felt that their fatigue was over 13 points, they had them take a break and they didn't have them continue on until that fatigue scale, and once again, self-perceived, so the patient, how they perceive it, till their fatigue scale came below 13 too. So that's something else to keep in mind, touching on what you just said, Dr. Yao, and what your question is, Dr. Uh, Dagenhart, is maybe as we're designing something like this, if they perceive their fatigue into a certain point, we have them take a break until that fatigue is back lower again. Yeah, we do know that if our primary outcome measures are self-report, the effect of placebo on that is far higher than if we had some type of objective measure such as PFTs and so forth. So uh, I think that's something we, we definitely need to consider as we can look at you know future designs of any study. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Yao, I just have a question, and please forgive me. I'm not a content expert, so this may be kind of left field. But um, when you say that you asked um, the patients to not be taking their medicine, um, how long did you give them before um, they came to see you to be off their medicine? Like, were they did they have to be off of it for a month first, or what was no, the case? No, 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 just overnight. Just overnight. Oh, so okay. Not okay. to take anything overnight. Don't take their morning dose because a lot of them are cinemat. It's like, you know, every, depending on how severe you are, maybe every every four hours, every three hours, some even every two. So I tell them to avoid their morning dose and we get them in early in the morning. We don't say, you know, come in the afternoon and we'll do these tests. They they came to the office like 9 a.m. and we try to be consistent mm -hmm. um, with their tests every time. Like we did the testing 9, 9 a.m. every time because then if someone came in at like, 12 noon, being off their meds even longer, that might kind of change their results. Right. Right. Yeah. I was and thinking. We, we, looked, we also looked at older studies, like other Parkinson's studies, not necessarily involving OMM, to kind of um, get an idea of what are some of these parameters. So uh, that's also really why you do a really thorough lit search in whatever study you're going to design, what's been done before, what things did they take into account in terms of limitations and having that experience. I have uh, a faculty member, Joanne Donahue, who it's a PhD and did a lot of Parkinson's publishing and, and research. And she really helped to with the design and pointing those things out. Like you can't have them come in on their medicines. They're going to be all, all over the place. And so these are things you kind of learn and from those who have been doing research in the field. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really important if we were to do, if DO TouchNet was to do a design uh, or a study to take that into consideration. Thank you, Dr. Yao. I was just very curious about that. Um, Dr. Brooks, did you have a question? Yes. So, again, I'm not a neurologist, Dr. Yao, and you just explained that you work with someone who has a lot of expertise. But just intuitively, it would seem to me that if patients are on a stable regimen of medicine, that it would, and that's that's going to be their reality, you know, except for the one time you told them not to take their medicine, their real, that's their baseline. So, when you say they're going to be all over the place, that can you explain that more? Because it seems to me that you'd want, just like exercise, if the standard of care is for them to be on their medicine, is for them to get regular exercise, whatever counseling they get from their neurologist or whatever, it seems to me that the questions are that we can address as an OMM community is how can we add to that? 
unless we think we're going to work some miracle and get people off their medicines or whatever, which I don't think we're anywhere near suggesting here. So perhaps you can shed a little more light on that. I can. I don't know, Brian, if you wanted to jump in first, because you had your hand. Okay, then I'll, I'll add after you. Okay, so it was pretty much standardized for these motor tests to be off medications. The, the absorption of these medications vary from patient to patient. In fact, they have different administrative administration of medications where they actually like have a um, direct, you know, peg into the stomach to give these medications. So everybody's absorption time um, and effect changes. And when as you get more advanced in Parkinson's, the effect of cinnamon um, decreases. So they start to have more freezing, more motor dysfunction, uh, and the medications wear off faster and faster. So in order to kind of, that's what I meant by all over the place. Like if I take the medicine, I might have peak cinnamon effect in like one hour. And if I didn't take it at seven, or if I took it at eight instead of not, it's like, so there's a lot, it's, a, it's pretty much standard to kind of remove that variable. I'm not saying I did that on purpose to prove that OMM is so much better when they're off medicine. It's that these tests that we use research-wise typically had the patients or subjects off medications when they perform these tests. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps. Yeah, it Thank is amazing you. how fast acting and fast resolving these medicines are. And so 30 minutes uh, of time can make a big difference in the effectiveness of, of a, an oral med that they may be taking. So uh, without a doubt, Sheldon, I agree that that is a requirement to be able to interpret outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Mancini also says the UPDRS is typically done off meds, just to um, add that comment to the conversation. Dr. Dagenhart, did you have another comment? I saw you raise your, your hand previously. Is that, no? Okay, all right. Um, so, okay. Dr. Oster, I do see your, your comment. Um, there's one right before you and then we'll get to that one. So this question is from Dr. Johns. It says, I missed the beginning of the presentation. Did any of these studies lend ideas to a comparative study maybe on body regions, i.e. lymph drainage or autonomics, et cetera, to compare one style of OMT over another? I wouldn't say to compare one style of OMT over another. These, this was a review article over the research that had been done within a 10 year window. And uh, looking at the autonomics, there was one that showed that it helped with constipation with Parkinson's disease. Otherwise we were looking at an improvement of the motor function and balance and control and even changes to gait. One of them had to do with onma massage, which was a traditional Japanese uh, massage. And that can actually help with lymphatics when you look at other studies that were not included in this article. I was just reading more about it myself because I was interested after finding out about it. Can help with lymphatics and obviously can help with muscle soreness and it shows to help with fatigue and also range of motion of different joints. So um, I think all these studies that were included in this study actually can lend to some great ideas on more studies that we can do moving forward, absolutely. And I think the big takeaway that I would take away is after reading this study is the importance of not just OMT on these patients, but also education and exercise for these patients. Thank you, Dr. Fleming. Dr. Brooks, I do see your hand. <clears throat> we have one question in the comments and then I will uh, get to you. Um, Dr. Oster says, I wonder if inviting patients in living facilities slash SNFs would facilitate transport, control of meds, et cetera, with this captive audience. Wasn't one of your studies that you were discussing, wasn't that the case, Dr. Fleming? Yes. The study that was done in China that actually had the largest sample size was actually an inpatient rehabilitation center where that was performed. So yes, no, that's an excellent thought. Um, sort of uh, what Dr. Yao has touched on for a lot of these studies, you have to look and see where their cutoff was because if their Parkinson's disease was too far along, they were excluded from the study. And also they did have to have, like Dr. Yao mentioned for the one study, they did have to already have motor dysfunction. So there was a period, a window there 
of where their symptoms needed to be for them to actually be included in a study. Because if they were too far gone, they were excluded. If it was still too early in the process and they weren't yet severe enough, they were also excluded. So it's something to also keep in mind. That's really interesting uh, that they sort of the sweet spot, I guess, for lack of a better way to put that. Um, yeah. Okay, Dr. Brooks, what did you uh, have to comment? Yeah, so I'm going to push back against Dr. Yao and Dr. Degenhardt a little bit. Um, I understand what you're saying, but this is a tension between observational and experimental research. And so my comment is, let's say you'd take them off their medicine and you showed fantastic changes in as a result of whatever OMT you did. But then they go back on their medicine. So you got to, you know, the reality of real life day in and day out. It's like I say some, to some of my patients, you know, I can't walk around mobilizing your body all day long. Once I get you loosened up, you're going to have to learn how to orchestrate your own posture and movement better, or you're going to be back in here. So my argument is it's both and. You're going to ask certain questions and learn certain things by taking them off their medicine. But I would argue there's also a need for investigation of them being on medicine because that's that's their reality 99% of the time. You know, and I think it's your research question. I'm going to say that because some of these studies did not take them off their medications and some of them did. It depends on the research study and what it is they're looking at and what they're trying to decipher. Yeah, and, and I would say, I, I can tell you there are a lot of good and bad research designs and I've done all of them. So um, uh, the bottom line is, is what's going to minimize confounders. And, and, and in order to have a clear answer that can then take you to the next level of research. So that's, I think, all that we're trying to do right now is to, to get a baseline that says, yes, there is an impact using manual therapy, OMT, for this condition. And because and, otherwise, we will never know if they're on medicine, what to attribute what to. Once we see that, then absolutely taking that into real world, more real world circumstances is the next step. So I certainly don't agree with you, Bill. It's just a matter of a stepwise process, in my opinion. Dr. Yao, did you have any uh, uh, comments to that at all? No, I understand where Dr. Brooks is coming from. I really do. And I think that uh, NIH and CAM also, um, the head of NCAM men mentioned that they want more outcome measure studies. And um, I know there was a question earlier about having, you know, sham and a, a proper control for OMT, which is hard because it's a procedure and it, it's been, you know, it, it's very challenging. And so um, I do feel like there is a movement to kind of look at more at outcome studies where we are integrating OMM in a certain patient population and no matter what medicine they're taking, they're getting better. Um, mm -hmm. But there's, for our specific study itself, like Dr. Mancini said, neurologists, when they do this test, even on their patients in a clinical setting, they want their, pa their, their subjects off medications. So we were just following standard of that specific test since we selected, as, so we selected that test as a measurement. And I do lean on and within my department, I have a clinical neurologist who's a movement specialist. And so that yeah, all these things, this protocol, all these steps that we take are to, like Dr. Degenhardt said, to make sure that we have less confounding factors when we initially perform this study. Mm -hmm. But I don't disagree with you. I do understand your point. And I will say just from uh, my observational study of one person, um, that a lot of times, uh, at least in, in his experience, he was very willing to try those things. So speaking to placebo and speaking to being off medicine and Parkinson's is um, damning in a lot of ways to life quality or the quality of life. And they're willing to try these things um, if they think at all that it could help. So yes, Dr. Dagenhart. I think if we could just take a moment before wrapping up on, on what, so what should be our next step? What are the 
potential solutions to take us to the next level of research in this area. In my opinion, I think it's really important, not only with Parkinson's, but any, any research direction we're taking, that we begin linking up with centers that are caring for the patients we're doing research, where there is a captured audience and they just, you know, have already standards of outcome measures. Um, people are used to going there. It can be integrated in some type of care plan uh, with them. And all of a sudden, our numbers are going to significantly shift, I think. Uh, I think right now, the MD world is very right, open you know, for building these bridges. And I think we need to begin prioritizing that in important areas. And Parkinsonism is certainly one that, you know, I've been watching the work out in New York for a long time. And, you know, with the, the Gates um, balance type of outcomes, I mean, we, we know there's something here. We just got to build that infrastructure to be able to look at it. And the only other comment I would say to that point, Dr. Dagenhardt, is, is Parkinson's isn't the only um, disease that ha has you know, these symptoms and things like imbalance issues and things like that. And I think building those bridges with these other disciplines and um, really focusing on that could only help Parkinson's patients, but also patients with other issues going on. Um, I think it would be really great to start doing some research here, for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, Dr. Brooks, um, if you want to um, make your comment and then we're going to wrap up, I think Jane has a few things she wants to say at the end. Just want to thank you, Sarah, for your service to this uh, group. Uh, I'm sorry to see you go. You've done a magnificent job, and I hope they can find somebody that does at least half as well as you've done. So, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Jane. Do you want to wrap us up? Well, Bill just kind of took away my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> I, I if, if for those of you who, who may not know, this is Sarah's last, let's talk about OMM research uh, seminar. She has uh, taken another position at ATSU and will be leaving DO TouchNet. And I just want to thank her for, for all she has done. She's been with us for almost two years and has has greatly improved all of our our outreach to to you all the members and uh, to to new potential members and we we will miss her input greatly. Thank you so much, Jane. I really enjoyed working with Dio Touchnet and meeting all of you and working with you guys for the last two years. I feel like even though a lot of it has been over Zoom, I know you guys. So making those connections has been really, really wonderful. So thank you guys so much. And thank you for your dedication to Dio Touchnet. The research that is done here is really important, as we can see. <laughs> all right. If there are no other comments or questions. Oh, Dr. Dagenhart. I just want to also thank uh, uh, Dr. Fleming for her presentation today. I, I want to keep everybody aware that we are always looking for uh, people willing to uh, present an article for our quarterly um, uh, journal club portion. So uh, if you have any ideas, please um, um, uh, send them in to us. Um, we are, are getting more and more people participating every month. Uh, at our last time we had 34 people attend. So we're really beginning to build a community here. And so I appreciate everyone presenting. We wanna wish everybody a very, very uh, restful, joyous holiday. And we're looking forward to 2023. I think we got some exciting things uh, in store for us. That's perfect. All right. On that wonderful note, thank you all for joining us today. Have a great afternoon and a great holiday season. Happy holidays. <laughs>